What makes a song a smash? Talent, luck, timing, all that and more. On Hit Parade from Slate, host Chris Melanthi tells tales from a half century of chart history. Through storytelling, trivia, and song snippets, Chris dissects how the artists you love or hate dominated the airwaves and shaped your memories forever. He's explained how Taylor Swift pivoted from country to pop, how The Cure got UK goth rock onto US radio, and how a young Stevie Wonder improvised his way to a Billboard chart topper. Subscribe to Hit Parade for tales of the hits from coast to coast, wherever you are listening right now. At heart, I'm very much a procrastinator. I I don't really want to do anything that I'm actually doing right now. (laughs) I wish I could like automate everything, Um, but I can't, (laughs) but I can't. And um, so how do I combat that? You know, for me, it was regiment. Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4, I'm in the studio. And when I'm in the studio, it's structure. So, you know, I'll, I'll make beats. I put them in different folders, upbeat, downbeat, jazzy, boom bap, et cetera. Mm. And then once I accrued a large amount of them, I'll arrange them from first track to last track. Mm. And I write from track one all the way to the last track. And once I'm finished writing, then I record in order, track one all the way to the last, and then I mix in order as well. And then I turn the record in. Wow. It's just a system that I created just to literally just combat my, what I really want to do, which is nothing. I have always had a special layer of respect for the artist who does everything themselves. Prince was famous for this. He'd play his own drums, bass, piano, guitar, and produce. This approach guarantees clarity of vision because no translation ever had to happen between the inner world of an artist and my ears. Odyssey has this clarity, and he's got a process to back it up. Listening to his music is sometimes a sharp analysis of political commentary. Sometimes it's witty observations, sometimes a vast, emotionally urgent landscape. But it's always, always beautifully crafted rhyme that takes you on a journey. My name is Maklit, and this is Movement. Stories of Music and Migration, Remixed. Would you start out by introducing yourself? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Amir, Abdelmanim Abdel Wahab Al Khalifa Muhammad, uh, known by my artist name as Odyssey. I am a hip hop artist from the DC area, DC, Maryland, and Virginia, specifically Prince George's County, Maryland. Can you tell us a little bit about Prince George's County, like when you were growing up? Uh, and, and and maybe for the folks who aren't too familiar with it, can you give us a little background on it? Sure, sure. It's, um, I guess you could say it's mid-Atlantic, and it's um, very much a hybrid of, of the culture between North and South. You know, not, not quite Southern to deep Southerners and not quite Northern to people from, you know, New York and above. Um, It's a place with a very, very rich, vibrant black culture, you know, that Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen in many other places in the States, uh, more so just to do with the fact that many parts of the D.C. area and the surrounding areas are majority black. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a very unique experience to grow up where everyone looks like you, you know, from Mm. your, your teachers, your doctors, the lawyers, the police officers, people working in shops, et cetera. Uh, you see a constant reflection of yourself in all aspects of life and, and the full spectrum from positive to negative. So you, um, the best way I would sum it up is to say it is one of the few places in America where you're a person first instead of a black person. Wow. That's very powerful. It's reminding me of 
if I'm I, I'm from Ethiopia originally. My father is from the south, and I, I of the country. I look a lot like him. Um, the first time I I went to Ethiopia, I, like as an adult, I was um, 21 years old, and I had just I the year before I had cut off all my straight hair and you know let my afro shimmer its way <laughs> into the sun. Yeah. And I'd also dyed it red and then and then like a year later the the tips were like bright orange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, so I went to Ethiopia and when I was in Addis Ababa man people were staring at me staring 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 it was really funny. Yeah that that, that would be very much a a shock for a lot of people yeah for sure. <laughs> But people still would look at me, even in Addis, like I was an outsider. It was really interesting. But then the first time I ever had the experience of looking like everyone around me was when I went to Southern Ethiopia. I was looking around. I was like, oh my, this is, do I look like everybody here? <laughs> and yeah. I, it was, it was a very interesting feeling. Um, yeah, that's, the, I mean, that's the the, the beautiful thing about America and our history is that, you know, with the exception of Native Americans, we all originate from someplace else. So there's some other part of the world where if you're you're lucky enough, everyone looks like you to a lesser extent, you know. Um, I'm, I'm Sudanese. My father's side is Sudanese. My mother's side is Black American. So I share a similar um, experience with going back to Sudan and getting off the plane and things that were only for you and in your household back in the States suddenly were just normalized, you know? Like what? Ah, uh, the food, the smells was one of the first mm -hmm. things, you know, I would oftentimes go to school and I would just reek of cumin and garlic and whatever else we were cooking in our kitchen. And yep. um, you, you go back to, 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 to Sudan or, you know, whatever perspective country you're from and those smells that you really only associate with in the home are everywhere. You know, um, that was one of the first things, first memories I remember is just the smell of everything, um, feeling very, very familiar in a place that I wasn't born in. Right on. What What was the music like in your house growing up? Oh, man, music in my house was great. My mother, funny enough, she, I wouldn't, how would you describe it? She listened to a lot of music that ne that her peers or her sisters and brothers weren't necessarily listening to. When everybody mm. else was jamming to Teddy Pendergrass, she was listening to Carly Simon. Mm. So she she would listen to a lot of that type of music. My dad would be listening to a lot of, you know, urban soul, R&B, jazz, funk, and then the Sudanese element as well was always there. And um, I was very lucky to grow up uh, neighbors with uh, Gary Scheider, who is a musician in Parliament and Funkadelic. And um, it was my dad wow. who re recognized him when he first moved in. And I became friends with his two uh, sons, Marshall and Garrett. And that really started the course of when we would get out of school, we would just hang out in Mr. Scheider's studio in their house and just jam out freestyle, rap, make beats, et cetera. And he would, you know, he would tutor us on how to record, how to mix, et cetera. So that, that started me doing it as a hobby. Uh, high school, a lot of my peers are into music. Uh, I meet a brother named Sean, who is an uh, upperclassman, a year older than me, and he's like, oh, I heard you rapping in the lunchroom. You nice. Why don't you come to my studio? Let's work on some music. Came to the studio, and uh, I'm looking around. I'm like, where's your drums? Where's your keyboards? He's like, oh, I sample. He's like, what's that? I'm like, what is that? Was, he's like, you don't know what sampling is? And he just sits me down for hours playing the original breaks from songs that were sampled and turned into hip hop music. And I just became fascinated with it and uh, very much begged him to teach me how to make beats. It's really interesting to hear you talk about the kind of light bulb of sampling yeah because when you when you were describing your neighbor it's like and being a part of parliament funkadelic it's like that is in so many samples like he, that person was probably playing you a parliament <laughs> sample at one point <laughs> yeah. and then there you were like you know earlier jamming with the with that family is yeah. there it's such a it, but it's almost like you you are describing like in community 
the through line of hip hop, like with the people around you. Yeah, it's it's pretty trippy when, you know, I look back on it um, and and seeing how many different facets of the culture that that I had access to um, and how this very roundabout way that I discovered things. Um, I would say I, I discovered sampling late too. I don't know what assumption I had because Mr. Scheider wouldn't let us sample anything. We were playing everything in the studio when we were composing things. Mm. So I guess I just um, assumed that people replayed everything. You know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm a child of hip hop, right? So I love the aspect of sampling and and, um, I'm from the East Coast. So it's it's very much a New York centric style of production. But being from the DC area where we have go-go music, uh, live bands are just everywhere. And live bands are very, very important. They're, They're probably more important than electronic music in DC to this day. So my production process is I start off sampling and uh, then I gradually have my band replay the samples and a lot of times I remove them sometimes I keep them in depending on what the sample is I love production that has a higher level of musicality in it and it's not just restricted to loops so as much as I love the loops and chopping up breaks, etc., I wanted to do a little bit more. I got some things that I need and some things that I want to a lesser degree. See the day and I get it tomorrow, but solo about checking my greed. People in comments are faking, it's honestly making it harder to be. You sell the space for your help is a stake if you want every product you see. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of the new album, To What End? Yeah. um, This record was the first full-length album that I had released in five years. Um, Wow. And I guess this album is about why it took so long, what I was going through, uh, and in the form of music, you know. Um, I had experienced, uh, for the first time, in my career, self-doubt during the making of this record. And in its early inceptions when I started work, I started, I've been working in the past five years, but I got to this point where I didn't like anything that I was making. And I, and I mm. felt that I had lost the ability to connect with an audience and make music that other people would like to listen to. Um, so hundreds and hundreds of beats, I'm producing song ideas, sketches wow. thrown in the trash. And I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. And My daughter was born in 2017. My son was born in 2021. We had the pandemic in the end of 2019, going into 2020, 2021. So my life was in a flux. I gotten out of the rhythm of making music with a deadline in mind that I had to meet, Mm -hmm. turning that record in, promoting that record, and touring. That had been my life for over a decade. You know, come home, I got three, three months to make this record make the record, put it out, go on the road. And I just kept doing that year after year after year. And then suddenly I take a break when my daughter's born. And then I take an even longer break that I didn't plan on with the pandemic. And in that time of all that time off, I had too much time to think. And I I had become victim of a a paralysis through analysis, you know, just Mm -hmm. really just overthinking everything. I had sought therapy um, and, you know, began to kind of dive into my personality and why would I be in this position right now? And I guess a lot of people mm-hmm. were during that time. And, um, you know, I come to the realization that necessity is why I started to do these things. Do I need to produce and create to live? Yes. Do I love to do it? Yes. So that was my why. You know, I love it and I need to do it. And how far am I willing to go for that why? And that's when the the subject matter was born and the title of the album was born to what end. So every song on the album is about why and how far I'm willing to go for that why, whether it be for love or for economic gains or um, respect or appreciation, et cetera. Um, They're all different examples of why 
I or I feel my observations of why people do what they do in life and how far they're willing to go for it, for better or for worse. You know, I mean, we all went through so much in the pandemic. Artists went through a particular filter of experiences. Um, and and it's also, like, I, I just want to reflect that, like, you know, going to therapy is... First of all, I think everyone should go to therapy, but that's not always <laughs> in our cultures, you know? No. So it's, was there like, like, how did you get through that, that like cultural barrier to going to therapy? Sure. You also don't have to answer that question if you don't want to. Like, oh, no, you just be like, I don't want to talk about it. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I haven't, my, my parents don't even know I'm in therapy. Neither of them, you know? Um, they they don't know that uh, I seek counseling, so I, that's not even a question that I've even entertained about um, <laughs> you know asking them or or getting their their two mm-hmm. cents on. Um, I know who they are, you know. I I know that they they did what they did so that I could have emotional articulation, you know, mm. um, and and that's something that um, I think is a disconnect with a lot of generations between children and their parents, whether they be from the same culture or third culture kids, is, um, mm-hmm. again, with the why, you know, um, I know my father's understanding on what success is, uh, or what happiness is, is based on a culture that is in another place and, right. and another, in another time, you know, um, for example, you know, my father wouldn't conceive being a musician for a living because that is not a viable living in Sudan. So that wouldn't be something that he would just say to me, you should do. Because what he saw growing up there was doctors, lawyers, engineers are sure bets to make a lot of money and survive. Um, there was no graphic designers. There was no photographers that were making a living. So why would those be examples that he would give me? So I won't hold it against him if I wake up in America and decide that these are the things that I want to do and he doesn't understand. Um, and to a lesser extent, even, even my mother, you know, my mother's American, my mother's black American, my mother grew up in poverty. And a lot of the things that I have access to, she didn't, whether it be just time in a, in a different era or even knowledge. So right. I do my best to articulate to my parents that I'm happy and I'm successful. Uh, and these are things that they can comprehend and understand, and that's not lost in translation over language, culture, or generation. Um, but therapy is for me. The end result is for me to be happy um, and to enrich the lives of people around me. And they don't need to know that I'm in therapy in order for me to do that, you know? So uh, right. I just, I don't even bring that up on the table. They, they have no idea. And they, they won't listen to this <laughs> interview anyway. They won't, even know it, they won't even know it exists. So it's fine to talk about it. Oh, um, that's interesting. But I, I, it's, it's really beautiful though. The, like the way you described your parents, it has so much empathy in it. You know, I almost want to use the word generous, but it's not about <laughs> generosity because it, it's more about like, uh, it's like, it's like the kind of thing people have to meditate to get to. You know? <laughs> like well, little, you know, <laughs> it's um, for better and for worse. That is the gift my parents gave me when uh, they got together. It, it stems from my early childhood memories on having to explain one to one side of my family about the other right and to right. have have this different pers- this unique perspective on being in the middle of a myriad of conversations and stereotypes and topics etc so you know i'm in sudan and they have all these ideas on what america's like and you know what black americans are like and why and i'm with my mother and my mother's family in thanksgiving and christmas and they have all these ideas on what africa is like and what foreigners are like and as you can imagine oh they've been here for 400 years and look what they've done and oh they come here and they take our jobs and i was always in the middle saying well actually you know um Mm. and and that well actually is is everything it's the subject matter of my music it's me um 
and I'm always trying to provide the other perspective. And with that comes an understanding of other people's perspectives. So the empathy for my parents, uh, it, it comes from them being different. Wow. You know, um, and me being a combination of both of them, you know. I mean, I think it would it'd be easier if I, some, I used to wish that I was just born in one culture. It would make everything really easy. But fast forward, it, it was a huge blessing, you know, because I can listen to my music and imagine what someone will think about it, you know, with, with mm. you using that, that same tool of empathy. So it's been great for my career and, and difficult for my personal life, I'd say. The album is To What End by Odyssey, and we'll play you out on a track from it called Many Hats that was actually inspired by Amir's therapy sessions. Movement is produced by Ian Koss and myself, Makli Tadero. Our co-creator and podcast godmother is Julie Kane. Our broadcast partner is The World. We are supported by the National Geographic Society and distributed by PRX. To many people on many things, but never me, and that's beginning to bear strain. My mother's hands, my father's shoulders, my friends' ears. I don't complain, I just pretend I'm in the clear. Disappear when I'm at my worst and I hide and work. Oh, my career to turn it hurt into ideas. To perseveres, the double edge, I run ahead. The devil back, cause what I fled still interferes. Two stepping off the pivot, been a traveler before I was a passenger. My baggage was just adding up. Growing up, I came to star, but as a happy fear. Getting 86, then he's second like the challenger. I know enough how to hold a bluff when the going tough. Feel like collapsing, but hold it up just for showing such. When many hats, but no graduation to throw it up. All I know is clutch. All right, baby, all right, baby, keep it moving, I don't stop, keep it moving, I don't stop. All right, baby, all right, baby, keep it moving, I don't stop, I keep it moving, I don't stop. These are crazy times we living in, Adam probably said that after God created him. We would tell the same sagas of our great fathers The day ain't harder, you just bother by the same events Feel my greatest attributes is what I'm lacking to Free from opinion, so I never learn to package truth Disagree with the consensus and they after you But what comes after you? My experience is a nerd If a dissident's a parent, if you listen, there's an urge Try skip it when I'm scared My depiction painted fair, can't resist the quick repair Not alive, you believe it, won't admit when I'm embarrassed Never try to be deceiving, but the pride of me was leading When you hide it, you depleted People line up for a share when they take a arm and leg Wonder if they see me bleeding, but they don't Not repeat what got me sewing what I wear Alright baby, alright baby Keep it moving, I don't stop Keep it moving, I don't stop all right, baby, all right, baby, keep it moving, I don't stop, I keep it moving, I don't stop.